The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're going to continue our study, pushing on from where we were last night. All these, all these studies now become interconnected. And if you're, all of a sudden you jump into a lesson and you go like, whoa, where'd that come from? Then you'll need to go back. I'm now on, I'm running this study out of Hebrews 10 on Tuesday and Wednesday. So you can go back and, you know, if you're interested and pick up where we left off. Well, here we are in verses 28 through 31. Last night, we looked at 26, 27. Um, actually, we looked at 25, 26, 27, actually. And, and this is the second part of a study that's going on in there. Uh, in verse 28, he says, uh, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies. And... Of course, that's back in Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy that uh, we talk about that. You probably have a study guide. Let's see. You have a study guide, Deuteronomy. Well, they just talk about it out of Deuteronomy in verse, in, in verse 28. But that gives you a reference about the subject matter of the old covenant. And he's, he's talking about, remember, he's talking about the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. Why would you go back to an old covenant? Um, when it condemns all the time. It's, it's, a, it's, its purpose was to condemn you and show you need a savior. And so he's, he's trying to make his point. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the witness of two or th uh, on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He's talking about capital punishment. Then he says in verse 39, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant? You remember the blood of the was shadow Christology, which shadow Christology, it was the shadow of Christ dying on a cross. That's important. Uh, and has regarded uh, as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. Let's see, verse 30. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. Now, I, I took my subject from that. If, if you have a, a study Bible, click in over there. Uh, look over there on, the, on the, where you pick up cross-references in the middle of it or somewhere. It will show you that in verse 30, you have do, uh, quotations from Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36. Mine says Luke 21, 19. Well, yeah, you'll have other references, but those are uh, quotes out of, these are quotes out of Deuteronomy 32, 35, and 36. Now, that's important to you. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32. Now, you will learn tonight, uh, just doing my introduction now, you will learn tonight that Deuteronomy 32 is called the Song of Moses. And it is his last word and testimony to Israel before he dies, 32. And so this is a very famous saying, and, and it's written as encouragement and warning. It's called the Song of Moses. In Deut that's Deuteronomy 32. They, he says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. Now, the Song of Moses is, is a very long song. And he pulled two phrases out of it as a warning because part of that song is encouragement and part of that song is a warning. To Israel. Uh, and it's an Israel of what? Judgment. 
Judgment about what? Moses will go on to talk about this before he dies um, in, in this section of Deuteronomy 32, 33, about the, fi the five cycles of divine di discipline and don't get into the fifth. Don't go into the fifth. The fifth is just terrible. Okay. Then verse 31, he comes back to verse 27. Look at verse 27. We, we talked about this last night. But a certain terrifying expectation of the judgment and the fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Look at verse 31. It's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. See the connection? Okay. This whole section is about that. All right. So we're going to look at this tonight. See, the problem sometimes of jumping into the middle of something like in Hebrews is Hebrews are going to run you back to the Old Testament because that was their Bible. They didn't have any other Bible. Their Bible was the Old, Old Testament. And so all the quotes and everything is going to be there. And you're not going to be able to use your New Testament to see what he's saying. You're going to have to go back to the Old Testament. And when you do, it requires a lot of reading to get information. They're, they're, they're very, Hebrews are very wordy. It takes a lot of talking to get a little information out of the Hebrew, in the Hebrew text. Where in the Greek text, boom, there in one sentence, you could be there for a long time. I mean, it's just the words are so dynamic. But it's the conversation in Hebrew, not necessarily the words that carry all the dynamic, dynamics like in the Greek language. It's the conversation. And so, but anyhow, we're going to look at that tonight. The Lord will judge his people. And, and what's going on, we talked about last night. We, we set all this up last night for you. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into tonight's. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin, it can be dealt with by understanding that the word of God identifies it, identifies what sin is. It could be, it could be mental attitude sins as categories. It could be sin of the tongue. It could be overt sins. They need to be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Not for, not, this is not a salvation idea. This is a spirituality idea it puts you back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit because you can't learn the Bible in carnality nor can you apply it that's very important to you and so our Heavenly Father we thank you tonight for these that have come our way we pray Father as we pause a moment for their a private time with you to confess sin if necessary or to pray that this study would have meaning to their life and their life would find meaning from it We thank you, Father, tonight for the privilege that we have as a believer priest under the new covenant to come before your throne, uh, seek your mercy, and find grace in time of need. Our time of need right now, Father, is Bible study. We've assembled ourselves together, and we, uh, we seek the Holy Spirit to teach us truth that will transform us into the likeness and image and plan of God, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... Remember that one, not the only theme of the book of Hebrews, but one of the great themes of the book of Hebrew and the one of the theme that we've been pushing in chapters 8, 9, and 10 has been the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. If you're under the law, get out from under it. If you're in a grace church, in a grace situation, a grace teaching, don't go back to legalism. Legalism can only condemn you. It's the most critical system you could ever be under. Very judgmental and is intended to be. But its intention was to point you to Christ, Galatians 3.24, to point you to Christ. You need a savior. That's the purpose of the law. It was never, it was never designed to save you. It was never designed to make you spiritual or holy or any of those things. It's not the purpose of the law. If you want to know more about it, you should read the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. It's the answer of the New Testament to the Mosaic Law. Now, one might ask, why would any New Covenant grace believer put himself under the bondage of the law? Well, why would anybody do that? I say that constantly since we've been in this study. 
Why would you do that? One reason they were doing it in the time of the book of Hebrews and why it was written to warn you not to do it, one of the reasons was they were being persecuted for their Christian faith. And I mean really persecuted. I'm not, ta I'm not just, ta I'm not talking about people talking bad about you. I'm talking about persecuting you, putting you in jail, uh, beating you up, uh, taking your house away from you, not giving you a mortgage and not allowing you to go to the assembly sessions. And it was really bad. You got to understand that. They were being persecuted. They were being persecuted in all the different areas of their life, social, family, business, nation, government. They were being persecuted. Listen, if you're not familiar with the voice of the martyrs, you ought to be, be familiar with that, and you'll find out it goes on in the world in a whole lot of places today just like it was then, the voice of the martyrs a great little book, magazine, uh, that reminds you of that. Well, next time when we come back, we're going to talk about the persecution they were under, which is described in our passage, Hebrews 10, verses 32 through 39. 32 through 39. Uh, because of the persecution against them, many Jewish New, Test New, New Covenant believers abandoned New Covenant grace teachings to return to the bondage of the law work system because of being enormously persecuted by people, uh, their own people, within their family structure even. Therefore, the writer writes this book. This is the, this is the main deal about the book of Hebrews. So the writer of Hebrews, what he does is he, he, he gives five warnings in this book these five warnings he spaces them out for example he puts one in chapter well i listed them all last night to you he lists them in chapters two well when and on forward all the way to chapter 12 he spaces them he puts in number two and he puts them here and so um what we're looking like he puts them in chapter two he puts it in chapter three and four he puts it in chapter five and six you know in spaces then he puts it in chapter 10. He puts it in chapter 12, all right? And, and so you're looking at um, how many chapters in the book? How many chapters in the book of Hebrews? 13? Yeah, 13. And so he spaces them out from chapter 2 all the way to 12. He, so he goes along, and all of a sudden he stops, and he, he, he gives them a sharp warning. And, and I listed all that for you last night and introduced you to that. That's how the book... Five enormous warnings. And what was the warning about? Don't go back to the law. Because if you go back, now listen, here's the other thing. The book of Hebrews, now this is really important because what he's talking about, the terrifying don't fall in the hands of a living God, he's talking about the fifth cycle of discipline. He's writing in 64. This is going to happen six years later in, in 70 AD. They're going to go under the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Rome. Listen, I told you last night, this was so bad that even the writers, good historian writers that write about it, can't tell you how bad it really was. <clears throat> it was so bad, you know, <clears throat> that they can't tell you all the gruesome stuff. Of course, I am tonight. I know, you know, blood and guts and all that. <clears throat> I'm going to go there because, listen, the Bible, listen, the Bible tells you what it's like. The Bible is going to tell you if you go under the fifth, this is what you're. This is who you're going to become under the fifth. Now it takes preparation to get to the fifth. It's called apostate reversionism. <coughs> you will become what you never thought you could ever be capable of, <coughs> ever in your life. There is nothing more tragic in human existence than being under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. Nothing. You could take the worst things in the world that ever occurred and it would be better than going under the fifth. The most brutal stuff that you can think of. When you go under the fifth, you lose your, you use your, you lose your humanity. Think about that. 
There's never been a day in your life when you've ever lost your humanity. In your worst day, you've never lost it. In the fifth, you lose it. You lose your humanity. And, and listen, people are, listen, r- historical writers like Josephus was afraid to write it as it actually occurred. Names, addresses, and places. Couldn't do it. You can't write about the terribleness of when people lose their humanity. What they're capable of. Well, anyhow. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews space out five enormous warnings on this subject matter throughout the book of Hebrews against apostate reversionism. We're in the midst of that study. Today's lesson will focus on another question. What will be the fate of those Jewish New Testament, New, New Covenant grace believers who return to old covenant law work system? Here's what he says. This is for sure. The Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. Now, he's not going to judge us in the church under the fifth cycle, but he does, he does bring discipline to us. Not to the degree he did to Israel. But he does bring judgment. And listen, how do I know it? Because I read, listen, I'll tell you why. Because he lays it out in the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation, the first, what, uh, four chapters. He lays it out. This year at the at the ministerial conference that we're going to have at Shaco, I'm going to talk about the church report card. The church gets a report card. He makes it very clear in the seven churches that he he gets report cards. I'm going to talk about it because we need to be in that good number. (laughs) He, He gets report cards. Tonight, we're going to look at five aspects of the Lord will judge his people. By the fifth cycle of divine discipline that's recorded in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Therefore, the writer is giving is issuing old covenant warnings to old covenant believers. He's telling you, don't go back to the priest nation of Israel who's who's already passed the fourth cycle and is going to the fifth. The fact that they were occupied by a foreign power, the the fact that the land of Israel was occupied by a foreign power, a Gentile power, and was there by power, shows that you're past, your next step, you're you're through one, two, three, four in five cycles of discipline. The only one left for you is the fifth. You can pull yourself out of it. and, And listen, they could have. He sent his son to rescue every person from it. He saved them, and then he told them to get out of Dodge. Go be missionaries. Get out of here. That's the story of Acts chapters 1 through 8. That's the story of of Acts 1 through 8. That is the story. (laughs) Wow. I mean, God, how wonderful God is to give you a heads up. You know, he gives you a heads up all the time. Then you don't pay any attention. And then you go like, why has that happened to me? And you go like, well... (laughs) <laughs> if you had to listen when God told you to start with, you wouldn't be in half the shape you're in now, right? And how many voices do you have to hear? Here's a guy who wrote a book on this very subject, and they wouldn't listen to him. Well, some did. Like, you always have some who listen and some who don't. That's, that's called pastoring, I suppose. Here's point number one. To tell you how we divided the subject up for your information so that you could really study this in in-depth. You know, this, the one thing about our church is we're not a fast food. We're a set down and dine. We're not a fast food. You, if you're looking for fast food, this is certainly not the place to be. You're going to have to stop and think in here. You're going to have to become a student of the Bible or else you're going to become just a, you're just gonna be as much lost in here as you would be anywhere. But you don't have to be because you study the Bible and stay up to current with us. Here, here's what I did. I divided the subject, the context of Hebrews 10, 25 through 39 into two general studies. 
Hebrews 21, 25, 10, 25 through 31 is where, we're, have I had prayer? Thank you. I could feel my engine. I couldn't remember if I had prayer. I do remember it now. I remember doing it. Uh, there's a title here, verse on 27 and 31, verse on, verse 27, 21. There's a title of this called, the, and I didn't come up with this title. This is the title, Danger uh, in 20, 25, 25 through 31, Terrifying Expectation of Judgment. And when you look at verse 27 and 31, you will see that. In verses, in the 10th chapter, verses 32 to 39, you're going to see the great conflict of suffering. And it, it is that for the cause of Christ that they went back to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant to get out from under per being persecuted every day all the time. You understand? I mean, it was terrible. Now, they didn't have to go back. They could have went forward. The fact that they went back is where you get reversionism. And why they went back is where you get apostate reversionism. Do you see, do you see that? Reversionism, sim simply reverse on your car. You have, you know, the old car, you shifted one, two, three, and you went forward. If you went backwards, you had one gear. That was reverse. If that didn't work, you put it in neutral, and you got two buddies to push you. <laughs> so... But that's where reversionism comes from. That's the concept. It's a concept in the Old, Old Testament called backsliding, going in reverse. Now, what we did with the first section, terrifying expectation, we broke it into two studies, the danger of sinful will, uh, will, sinning willfully, which we did last night. And then tonight we're talking about 2831, the Lord will judge his people. That's our study tonight. The second thing, so that's how we're laying this out for you so that we can walk you through something that's really... Listen, you could go in here and you could study that. You could look at that until you went blind and never get this. It takes a lot of information out for you to get this. And there, These five warnings in the book of Hebrews cause so much apostasy in the church. They're so misunderstood because they don't study the Old Covenant. They don't understand. They don't link. They get these passages... You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Lord will judge me. They don't, they don't look back and study where it came from. They don't, look, put, they don't connect the dots. They just push forward and say, let, let, they tell you what they want you to tell you. And they, I don't know. I just drives me nuts. I don't want to drive you nuts because of it. Point number two, the book of Hebrews was written about 64 AD as a warning to Jewish New Covenant believers in Israel. This is where this book, that's why it's called the book of Hebrews. <laughs> Come on. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. Uh, they didn't call it the book of Gentiles. They called it the book of Hebrews. The Jewish New Covenant believers who returned to the law have placed themselves under, and their families in greater danger of the fifth cycle of divine discipline, which was knocking on the door. See, you got to understand that Israel was already under, I had already gone through four cycles. The fact that Gentiles were occupying their land with authority, you can't do anything in there unless Rome said you, you got permission. Now, Rome gave them a lot, of, a lot of leeway because there was friendships and all kinds of historical things connected. They gave them a lot. They got them a lot. Listen, because God is gracious, he sent his son into that. Listen, when he sent his son, he sent him into a, a, a nation, a priest nation was in, already into the fourth cycle. Right? If you read the story of Luke, you will get that. And you know what they're going to do under the fourth cycle? They're going to drag him out of Israel, so to speak, out of the limelight of Israel and kill him. They're going to murder him. <laughs> and guess what's going to happen then, buddy? The snowball is rolling. And if you're from the north, you know it just gets bigger and stronger and faster. Well, I'd say if you're from anywhere that has snow, I didn't mean to not include you right, out in Connecticut. I've seen it, John. Okay. okay. So they're going to, under the fifth cycle, it's for sure when they murder his when they murder his only begotten son as the answer to the law of condemnation they're going to they're going to get whacked 
the snowball is on, is on the move. And listen, how marvelous is that? 30 AD, God gives them 40 years of grace, and, and they still don't do it. I mean, that, that's apostate reversionism if you ever saw it. Jesus taught on this very subject in the parable of a tenant. Look over there in Matthew 21 with me. He taught this very thing. And I'll tell you what's amazing to me, and I said this the other, I said this last night. What amazes me is when he teaches this, he knows who the players are in this parable. He knows who the players are in the parable. Now, here's our parable. We're going to look at this parable, 33 through 46. We're going to look at some of it. 21, 33. Now, if you have a study Bible, they probably call it the parable of the land order, owner or the tenants. tenants. Listen to another parable he wrote, or he says, there was a land order who planted a vineyard and put a small wall around it, dug wine press in it, and built the tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. See the vine, rented it out to vine growers, right? To Israel. Now listen, this is a parable. What you're looking for is one big main idea. There's going to be a lot of stuff. You know, it's kind of like a magician. You know, he, he, he does with one hand and slips it with the other one. You know what I mean? So you got to be careful with a parable. You're only looking for one big point in a parable. Even though you got a lot of players, don't be distracted by everything. Keep your eye on the, on, on the little ball that's being passed between the three cups. All right? <clears throat> When the harvest time approached, he sent, now here we're in a parable. He sent his servants or slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves, beat one, killed another, stoned a third. If you, if you listen to that, that's progressive. Listen, with the first group, he, he did what? With the first group that was sent out, what'd they do? They beat him up. They beat him up and sent, sent the message back, right? Sent a message back. Beat him up pretty good, sent the message back. Uh, tell your guy this, right? You, you've seen enough cowboy movies, you know, that this is how this works. <laughs> right? But listen, the owner sent another group in. What'd they do with that group? Killed them. You know why they, hey, listen, listen, now this is important. We don't know how they kill him. Maybe they beat him to death, but there were a lot of ways to kill people, and they used several ideas. Because the owner didn't get the first message, right? Who, who's the owner in this parable? God. <laughs> God. Apparently, you're not listening to me, God. So they sent back. Is the second one a stronger message than the first one to the owner? I they kill him. Killed them. Sent the body back. What was the third one they did? Now, what's the difference between stoning and, and, and murdering? The law. You know what the difference is? The law. Stoning was capital punishment in Israel. That was, that was capital punishment. They went from beating them up, which was against the law, by the way. <laughs> Beat them up. Murder them. Is that against the law? Then the people, and sending a message to God, right? Send a message to God. The, 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 the next time, they turned around and used the legal system to kill them. Which is a very strong thing, because now you, they have the law on their side. The first two, they didn't have the law. The third time they went to, because God is not listening, they went and did the law. They shoved the law back in his face. Because they're apostate reversionists, it shows you the progression of bitterness and hardness of heart. How far one can drift away. And you know where they are? They're, listen, they're preparing, listen to me now, because you're missing this. They're preparing themselves to lose their humanity. They're in a process under apostate reversionism of becoming hard-hearted to a point that when God gives them the fifth, 
it will be just a quick step into the loss of their humanity because they're moving in that direction. Do you not see that? Do you not see the progression that they've gone? Now watch this. Back to our, back to our lesson. He keeps sending groups larger than the first. They do the same thing to them. Afterwards, he sent his son. When Jesus Christ comes into Israel, they're in the fourth. They're in apostate reversionism. But he offers them an olive branch. He sends his only begotten son into the most unbelievable conditions and offer them all the way out. Watch this now. Afterwards, the owner, this would be God, sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. They're the people of the book. I gave them the book. Right? I gave them the book. The book will tell them. You respect my son as you respect me. Now, do you suppose God knows how that's working? Huh? Have they respected him yet? They beat the first one sent. They murdered the second one sent. Then they used the law to publicly execute anyone else he sends. Sends a law. Anybody else you send, I will publicly execute them and be applauded for it. And they did it over and over again. Agreed? And I'm telling you, what they're doing is they're losing each step of the way in the hardening of their hearts. They're losing the, under apostate reversionism. They're losing their humanity. They're losing their humanity. You know what I mean? How, how one should treat another. Love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. Right? Strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Oh, they're way past that. Oh, they're way past that. They're way past. Yeah, but that would be a, a close example. They're, but they're way past that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. When the vine grower saw that his son, when the, when, the, when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. See, they understood. They understand who Jesus Christ was. This is the heir, the heir of God. That's the son of God. Come, let us kill him and seize the inheritance. They think they have, listen, they think they have the law behind them and able to do this. Did they? Listen, did they actually, but listen, did they actually use the law to do it? Yes, they did. They used Jewish and Roman law to do it. Rome said, this is the craziest thing I ever heard. They went like, look, you either do it or we, we're going we're gonna to scream to Caesar over you. Well, you know all that history background. All of that stuff is in this parable. All of this stuff is in that parable. And Jesus knows who the heir is in this parable. Does he not know? He's predicting that they will murder him. They, they will do it legally. And he tells them that. And, and certainly it plays out under, under, he goes through Jewish court. He goes through Roman court. And he, this whole thing plays out, doesn't it? Wow. I mean, this is this amazing parable. And they took him. Th th we're back to the parable. And so they took him, the heir, the son, and they threw him. Watch this. They threw him out of the vineyard. You know why? They wanted to show that they took possession and ownership of the inheritance. And they murdered him outside the vineyard. And boy, was that, is that not what they did with him as well? Huh? On the hill of Golgotha. <laughs> now, listen, now we're down to crunch time. Now we're getting down to why did he give this parable? Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, here's the big question. 
he asked his audience, what will he do to those vine growers? Listen to what the people said. The people who heard the parable said to him, he will bring those wretched to the wretched end and will rent out the vineyard, watch out now, to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Look what he said now. What do they feel would be the right recourse that the vine are uh, wretched to bring him to a wretched end? Right? The, and the, the, that's what's going to happen. It's, it's exactly what's going to happen to him. It, wretched end is the worst possible end you could have in life. You know what wretched is? Wretched is worse than beating, murder, and stoning. Now listen, Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scripture, Old Testament scripture, and of course there's a, there's a reference for you, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone, this came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, now pay attention. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. Is he explaining the parable? Oh, yeah, he is. Did he, say, did he tell them that in the parable? Oh, yes, he did. It's going to be taken from Israel. It's going to be taken from Israel. And it's going to give it to another people. Guess who he gave it to us? Listen to me now. Look up here. He gave it to you and me. He gave it to us. The church. He gave it to us, the church. He gave it to us. He gave it to us. <laughs> the inheritance. We are the heirs of the inheritance of the son. We are joint heirs. We are joint heirs with Christ in inheritance of the joint heirship. Holy catfish. How could you not have a good day knowing that? And he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but on whom the stone falls, it will shatter him to dust. Listen, he's talking about Jesus Christ. It's your attitude towards Jesus Christ. If you, if you reject him, you're in the worst shape of life. If you accept him, you're in the best shape in time and eternity. Oh, man. What a powerful. Listen, this parable is dynamite. That's part of point two. <laughs> okay. The kingdom of God will be taken from you. Listen, we, he goes on to say, and they understood finally this parable and what it means. Yeah, if you went on and read. God's warning to the Jewish new covenant believers is to tell them that this day is coming. The wretched end of the wretched people is going to come to an end. And the vineyard is going to be taken from them and they're going to give it to another people who respect my son, who respect my son. I'm going to tell you, the church better never lose its respect for the son of God. You know why? Because he's still the Lord. Watch this. He's still the Lord who will judge his people. Now, you'll never go under a fifth because that's not what the church age is about. But he still will judge his people. How you treat the son of God is very important. If we get nothing else from this study. In Acts 8.1, it reads, And on that day a great persecution be began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Verse 4 says, listen to me. It says, I want you to look at Acts 8.4. Make sure you know what this word preached is. Because I don't know what you think preached is, but they make it very clear in the Greek language what this word preached is. 
Acts 8, 4. And they went out. Listen, this is how this should read. And they went out evangelizing. Does yours say preach? They, they preach the word. But that's not what they, that's, not, that's, too, that's too general. What the Greek says is they went out evangelizing. They went out preaching the gospel. Listen, that's what missionaries do. That's what ambassadors for Christ, that's the whole purpose of ambassadorship of Jesus Christ, isn't it? I mean, it's about the gospel. It's not the only thing we do, but it's the main thing we do. You know, Horton says, keep the main thing the main thing. That's the main thing we do. And what a joy it is to share the gospel with somebody that you know in your heart really needs it. Listen, that's our job. Make it clear. Let the Holy Spirit do his job, and you can walk away. Look, and you can walk away clear on that thing because I've done, I've done what the ambassadorship is supposed to do. I shared the gospel with clarity. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction, and someday down the pike, my prayer is he'll be saved, and I will hold that person in prayer. Listen, the people I share the gospel with, I hold them in prayer until I get some word back. Right? Because some plant, some water, some harvest. And I want that process to go on. And so I keep my prayer on top of that person. That's just me. But that's, that's what I think. Here's point three. Our lesson text is a quote. Now, let's go back to our lesson text in Hebrews, if you don't mind. Let's go back to Hebrews 10th chapter for a moment. And let's pick up. Now, you know a great lesson in, in your life, and it's an easy one to teach. You got to people, what a great, a little Bible study with your people that you have a chance to give is the parable. Is that parable not a phenomenal parable? Is that, that parable is phenomenal. I mean, think how you could deal with that. But anyhow, just, I'm just saying that is a pretty good Bible study. Uh, here's Hebrews 10. We're back to this subject matter. Uh, um, he says in verse 28, anyone who sets aside the law of Moses dies without, he's back to that house where I'm back down. I want you to drop down to verse 30 for we know him who said, vengeance is mine. I will repay again. He says, the Lord will judge his people. The Lord will judge his people. So I want to come back to that because listen, look, you remember we looked and we saw that vengeance is mine. That's a uh, 32, uh, 35 agreed in the footnotes on your footnotes in your Bible, and then the Lord will uh, judge his people, that's, that's 3236, right? Now, this, I just want you to put your eyes on it. We're not going to study the whole thing. We're not even going to read the whole thing, but I want you to go to Deuteronomy and put your eyes on it. I want to see how long, I want you to see how long this is and, and what a dynamic, um, this is called the Song of Moses if you have a study Bible. Go to 32, and um, do you see, is, do you have a study Bible? Does it say, it should say something like the Song of Moses. I mean, it's very famous. And, and I'll tell you, it's, a, it, it's, it's worth a study sometime. It's so, it's so heavy in Hebrew. Um, does anybody have a title? If you have a study Bible, and you have any other title other than the Song of Moses, could, could you tell me what it might be? Is it, everybody have that? Uh, 13. Yeah, th 32. Oh, 32. 32. Yeah, 32. Uh, so mine says, uh, Moses, hymn of joy. There you go. Yeah, that's good. So it's a Song of Moses. All right. Now, let me give you one. I'm, I, you know, I've, re I've read this whole thing. I've studied it. But verse 2, I love verse 2 because I'm a farm boy. I'm a pastor teacher who comes from, a, I'm, a, I'm a farm boy at heart. Mm -hmm. I'm a, that's who I am. And so when I read, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible for my life as a pastor. Let my teachings drop as the rain my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets of fresh grass on the fresh grass and the showers on the herbs. 
I like the way, if you have a, a you ought to read this in the NIV. It, it kind of brings it to a, a different light, and it's really interesting uh, what they caught on it. But uh, for those who teach the Bible, uh, there's a, a little something. For those who teach the Bible, there's a little there's a little nugget from God for us. Now, what we're looking for, look at verse 4, the rock. The rock. That's going to become important to us. And then let's drop down. They, they, he pulled. Well, look how big this is. Are you, look how many. Look at, look, there are 52 verses in this. Now, when we get, when we get to verse 48, the, it's going to be over, and then Moses is going to go to the mountain, Nebo. He's going to look over the land. He's going to die. All right? But this is a long song. I mean, this is really a big song. And, it, it, and th this is what. Now, he, the writer of Hebrews connects us with two verses. So let's take a look. Th verse 35. Th th and, and he only quotes part of it. But in verse 35, because Moses is warning his people of the cycles of discipline of possessing the land. When you possess the land, you're going to be under, you, there, there's an honor system you're under or you could lose it. So he says, vengeance is mine. Um, I, I forget how they wrote it in the text here. Vengeance, vengeance is mine, I will repay. I will repay. Uh, vengeance is mine, mine says mine. Vengeance is mine and retribution. And, and then he, he skips all this aspect of the fifth and he drops down into verse 36. He says, the Lord will vindicate or judge his people. See that? And he doesn't go on and will have compassion on his servants. He was a, because he's not interested in that because what he's after is bringing out the point that the Lord will judge his people. If you go back there, I'm telling you, we're in the fourth. See, they knew this if they opened the scriptures, right? Oh, Moses, Moses is my man. If he can't do it, nobody can. Moses, Moses, he's my man. They said, well, if Moses is your man, let's go back and take a look at it. Let's go back and listen. Here's what the writer, let's go back and look at his final words, his last declaration to Israel before he dies. It's the song of Moses. It's a very, very famous song. And he pulls out a couple of deals out of that to show that what Moses was warning you about, we're there. We are there, people. We are there. The next knock on the door is the fifth. We are there. See, and he pulls out pieces of that to show you uh, what he's trying to warn them of. Because, listen, part of the song of Moses is encouragement. Drive forward. Take possession of the land. Be there. I'm not going to be with you. I'm looking out at the land. Go possess the land, right? And Joshua picks that mantle up, doesn't he? Go possess the land. Sends out spies. They come back. Moses goes like, we're in trouble. And Joshua is going to have to take him into the land to possess it. And so, there's a, so part of this song is great encouragement, and the other part is a warning because the writer is trying to space warnings out in this book of the fifth cycle, he pulls out the warning section out of the Song of Moses, not the encouragement sections. You understand? All right. Just telling you. I know. Your brain hurting a little bit now? Go, hmm? oh, geez, Ron, how, how much longer you got? Not much. We're close. The Song of Moses has many warnings to the priest nation of Israel, and one of them is in verse 15. Jeshurun, which means upright Israel in Hebrew, grew fat and, and kicked. You have grown fat and thick and sleek. You have forsook God who made you and scorned the rock of his salvation. And you know what they're going to get? Judgment. The Lord will judge his people. You see, when you scorn the sacrificial offering of God's only begotten son, you get in big trouble with God according to the parable that Jesus gave. 
not only the Song of Moses, the writer is going to talk about it in chapter 10, verse 29, when he says, when you trample underfoot the Son of God and has and have regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, you're in deep trouble. Don't go back to that system. Do not go back to that system. You see, the key warning out of the Song of Moses to the Jewish believers that the writer of Hebrews makes mention of the last will and testimony of your great leader issued a warning to you that you're not heeding. That's his point. The Lord will judge his people. Point four, following the song of Moses, Moses warned them again personally. He said, take to your heart, listen to this now, take to your heart all the words which I am warning you today, which you should command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law. In other words, in the Song of Solomon, not just the words of encouragement, but the words of warning. For it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. See, some of you are getting that, and that excites me. Some of you actually have bought into that, and you're smart to have done that. Listen, the word of God is not just something we carry around and read once in a while or, or open it up when we're in trouble. It is our what? It's our life. And when that clicks that into your soul, the Bible becomes the most important book in your library. It's worth reading every day. At some point, it'll become the source of every decision you make that's important in your life. And then it'll, become down, it'll boil down to every decision you make in your life. Not just the important ones, but every one. Because every one of them is important when you walk with the Lord. I'm just telling you. It's not an idle word. It, it is your life. And by this word, you will prolong your life. You know, people, they say to me, well, Ron, how long do you expect to live? And I said, 120. And they go like, <laughs> You know what I base it on? I don't base it on genes. I base it on the promise of the word of God. What did he tell me? If I will make the word of God my life, and let me tell you, I have. Not, and I, listen, it's not, listen, I made it my life before I ever went into the pastorate. It's not my life because I make money. It's not my life because I have a church. It's my life because I love the word of God more than any book. I, and, I, and I love to read. This is the book of life. You know what he promised Ron Adema? If it becomes your life, it will prolong your life. And I find 120 in Genesis 6, and I claim it. And people say to me, gosh, you look young for your age. And I said, well, wh wh what do you think my age is? And so they guess all kinds of craziness. I don't care. You know what I tell them? I tell them, the Bible is my life. And it promises me if I will eat it and digest it and make it the source of my life, it will prolong my life. Prolonging my life, for why would you want to prolong your wife? Life. Why would you, my wife too, why would you want to prolong your life? Listen to me now. This is important because of ministry. Listen, I'm as ready today as I've ever been to meet the Lord and be with him. This, he's the champion of my life. But I too have come like Paul. Listen, yes, it would be far better for me to leave and be with the Lord in the fullness of his grace and honor. But because of you, the ministry, the opportunity to bring people to Christ, to see other people come to the joy of the word where they eat upon it and, and they love it and they prom God promises that there is life prolonged with it. 
I take this stuff serious. It's not new with genes. I got people that died at all kinds of ages in my family. You think I'm the only guy in this room that this promise works for? Huh? Might be the only one who took it serious. Maybe not. I'm telling you why I do. And I gave you a verse. It comes right out of the song. You know how old Moses was when he died? And you know what? He could have lived longer. Oh, yeah, he could have lived longer. He could have. I read him a lot. God, I don't want to make those mistakes. Peter warns, warns these same people. John warns these same people, like the writer of Hebrews does. John warns. He says, he, Jesus Christ, came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as do receive him, what a wonderful promise. To them he gave rights to become the children of God. And boy, did God open that door with Jesus Christ, didn't he? There are no racial boundaries. There's no educational boundaries. There's no, there's no educational boundaries. There's no social boundaries. None. What, you know, you're all one in what? We're all one in Christ. <laughs> Hoo -ah. Peter warns, therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has sent him, Jesus Christ, both to be Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. I want you to go to Deuteronomy because I got to quit. I want to show you the fifth cycle. I, wa I want you to see it. Now, listen, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Deuteronomy, let's go Deuteronomy. This is tough. If this was in a movie, you, you couldn't have took it. If, if they was to put this in a movie, you could not take it. I, I tell you if, you, if you put this in in actual how, and this is the loss of, of a person's humanity that Jesus talked about in the parable, the loss of humanity. Now, I'm looking, I wrote this down here. I'm in Deuteronomy 28. I'm looking from 52 to 57. I just picked out a short piece of this. This, this is not all of the fifth. I think I put all of the fifth. Deuteronomy 28, 32 through 68. I'm just reading one small part of it. This is the part. This is so unbelievable. Verse 52. And it shall, and it shall besiege, talking about a foreign power, it shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land. It shall be. It shall besiege you in all of your towns throughout your land, which the Lord your God has given you. Watch this. Then you shall eat the offspring of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you during the siege and the distress by which your enemy shall oppress you. The man who is refined and very delicate among you shall be hostile towards his brother and towards his wife. He cherishes and his brother and wife whom he cherishes and towards the rest of his children who remains so that he will not give an even even one of them any of the flesh of his children which he shall eat since he has nothing left during the siege and the distress by which your enemies shall oppress you in all of your towns the refined and delicate woman among you who would not venture to eat the sole of her foot on the ground for del would not set, I'm sorry, would not set the sole of her foot on the ground for the delicateness and the refinement. She'll be hostile towards her husband. She cherishes and towards her sons and daughters and towards her afterbirth, which issues from between her legs, legs and towards her children whom she bears. For she shall eat them secretly for lack of anything else. And during the siege and the distress by which your enemies shall oppress you in all the lands. If you are not careful to observe all the words of the law, which are written in this book, to fear this honored and awesome name, the Lord your God. I mean, 
Listen, if you don't think that's going to happen, then you don't believe the word of God because that's what the fifth is, and it's worthless. Is that, listen, when I say, listen, apostate reversionism, you can stay in it so long you can lose your humanity. Would you not say that was the case of losing one's humanity? I mean, he, he listen. Why would you not come to Christ and listen to him? He told all of these people, don't go back to the law. Leave the area. Leave it. Take the message of Christ to other vine growers, right? To other vine growers. Take the message to other vine growers. Get out of Dodge. A sad day in the history of Israel. And boy, did Rome put it on him. The Babylonians put it on him too. Rome put it on him. And it, it was so bad that the only way you can really know what happened is read the Bible because the people that went out to report it couldn't report it properly. This is how bad it got. Father, we're so thankful tonight for your love and grace and mercy and salvation through Jesus Christ that never could come to us. Could come to a nation, but not even the fifth. We're a client nation. There is no, there's no priest nation anymore. Israel was the priest nation. Exodus 19.6. It's about the church. Today, it's about the church. The divine agency of the church. Not a nation. It's a church. It's the church. We can set in any nation. It's the church. I'm so thankful today, Father, to be in America and to be in a great nation that allows us the liberties. But listen, our liberties are in jeopardy because we see apostate reversionism in the, in the sphere of divine institutions today. Our nation is in trouble. The church has got to be more vigil than ever before. We have to be able to encourage and warn at the same time the people of our nation. The church has got to be solid. They got to be solid in their doctrine. The message of the gospel. We've got to care about our people. We've got to care about our people. We can't listen. We've we've seen people in our families probably who have lost their humanity or close to it. Who do who do we're beginning to watch a nation who couldn't imagine love your neighbor as yourself. It's a dangerous time. The church has got to be vigil of offering salvation and teaching the truth of the word of God, how to make the Bible, make the Bible come alive in people's life in such a way that it becomes a living book, a dynamic book, a Hebrews 4.12 book that cuts to the divide of the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrows becomes a critic of the thoughts and tensions of our hearts and our hearts are leaning heavily towards God. Father, help us be that church. Help us be that church. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us.